journey of the Magi. We welcome all of you who are joining us online or on YouTube. You are a valuable part of our worshiping community here at Woodlawn. Our New Testament lesson comes to us today from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the second chapter, beginning with the first verse, as this is the narrative of the visit of the wise men. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and we've come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him, and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. Then they had heard the king and set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of life. Thanks be to God.
You have just viewed a clip from the 1959 classic film, Ben-Hur, that reveals to us and opens up in our hearts and our minds as we reflect on the scripture today, many of the traditional images that we associate with the journey of the Magi or wise men as they are known, as they worship the Christ child. Of course, Hollywood took the route that most of tradition did for centuries in bringing the wise man to the actual stable. And in our own recreations of that, in our nativity scenes, just as the one here at our altar today, we have the wise men present. But when one reflects upon the scripture, we hear that they came into the house. Matthew says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and worshipped him. Where is the one born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. The season of Epiphany crowns the season of Christmas and it completes the very beautiful, rich tapestry that is the story of the coming of the Christ. And it is, I think, one of the most unforgettable narratives ever recorded throughout all of history and the world's religions and even in the greatest of literature. Epiphany, and the very word epiphany, reminds us of being illumined, growing in our understanding, Epiphany and this season of Epiphany illuminates and helps us to understand what the role of the Magi was and encourages us not to let the power of their story be so diminished by our ignoring the scriptural record that we insist that the tradition should be held up over the truth of the matter. So we must go back to the text. Matthew presents their story not in the context of the manger, but in the home of the Holy Family. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. And on entering the house, they saw that the child was with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Now, we know from the biblical narrative itself that this time was a very critical, crucial time for this holy family. We also know and understand that Herod's wrath was so great that he insisted that all of the male children be slaughtered because of his extreme jealousy over the birth of the Christ child. So as we read of this biblical narrative, and its record of the visit of the Magi, we find the Magi visiting not in the stable, as we have traditionally associated them with, but in the house, the home of the Holy Family. Now let's focus a little bit on who these persons were. Often referred to as kings themselves, we know that the wise men were most likely earlier astronomers. These astronomers would have studied the stars, would have known the stars, they would have had a faith and a belief in the heavens in relationship to their containing signs of the birth of those who would be very impactful of daily life. And so they come. They come starstruck, if you will, coming upon the notion that the one that they are worshiping will himself be a king. Now, they would have had no kind of notion of the kind of king that this star had led them to. And so the story itself finds them bringing royal gifts to him, frankincense, gold, and myrrh, all three of them precious substances, and also symbolically, and as it turns out, with some sense of the future that Christ will know himself. These gifts, particularly the frankincense and myrrh, are associated with burial. 
Now it's a fascinating thing to trace how the Magi have surfaced over and over again in the art and in the culture that we know as Christians. The great poet T.S. Eliot, a Christian convert himself to Catholicism, in his wonderful poem, Journey of the Magi, imagines their trek, their journey. He says, a cold coming we had of it, just the worst time of the year for a journey, and such a long journey, at the end we preferred to travel all night, sleeping in snatches, with the voices singing in our ears, saying that all of this might be fallen. Eliot does a magnificent job in this poem of relating to us the reality of what such a journey, how arduous and difficult it would have been, and that there would have been moments of discouragement and great frustration and great temptation as well to turn back. And so the poem ends with these words, all this was a long time ago, I remember, and I would do it again, but set down, this set down, this, we were all that way led. There was birth, certainly, but no longer at ease here in this old dispensation. I would be glad of another death. And so Eliot in this poem reminds us of the reality of a death that will loom in the future for the very one that the Magi had come to worship. So this king would be no ordinary king. The Gospel of Matthew contains the one account we have of the Magi's visit, and perhaps more than any other biblical narrative that we have, Tradition has shaped its reception by all of us. While Matthew never numbers them, we have. We have associated them with the number three. We have also named them, as you will see in the slide that will be provided to you. Now this number of three, of course, is related to the three gifts that they bring. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It was the early church father, Origen, that defined the meaning of the gifts as gold as an appropriate gift to a king, myrrh as to the one who was mortal, son of man, and frankincense as to a god, son of God. We also know that tradition has named them Haspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. This is no more beautifully reflected than in Manati's 1951 moving opera, Amal and the Night Visitors. The great composer Manati had visited the Metropolitan Museum in New York and standing before Hieronymus Bosch's image painting Adoration of the Magi that you will see. He was inspired to compose this magnificent opera. The story, as he relates it, has Melchior, the wise man, confessing to an impoverished mother who covets the gift of gold for her own child who is lame and crippled. And the child and the mother here the great Melchior relate these words. O oh, good woman, you may keep the gold. The child we seek doesn't need our gold. On love, on love alone, he will build his kingdom, and his pierced hands will hold no scepter. His hallowed head will hold no crown. Thus, Monadi, illumines for us the reality that this king that they will worship will be no ordinary king. And then we go back to the image that you saw in the film clip from Ben-Hur, which takes us back to the novel itself. In his novel, Ben-Hur, the author Lou Wallace 
has the wise man Balthasar returning to Judea years later, seeking the one that he had seen as a child and that the other Magi had visited with him. Balthasar meets Judah ben Hur. Ben Hur is an embittered and vengeful young man who longs to take the life of his enemy, Messiah. But Balthazar pleads with him to leave Masala in God's hand and to join Balthazar in seeking the Christ child, who is now, by this point, of course, a man. And as he invites him to seek the one that the star had led him to, he says, this very evening he is near. He saw the sunset this evening as we did. He lives, Bethalsar says, and all of our lives from now on will carry his mark. The wonderful novel and the film itself ends with Balthazar finding Christ, but doing so as he hangs upon the cruel reality of the cross. And while Ben-Hur has achieved his vengeance against Masala, he's still bitter, and he cynically observes to Balthazar, the wise man, so this is what your search has led you to? And Balthazar replies, for this end he was born in that stable, and for this cause he came into the world. As we come to this place today, to worship just as wise men journeyed to the site of the birth of the Christ, so we come here today knowing the cause that we are here for. We are not here because we are starstruck. We are here because we have been moved by the power of the Holy Spirit to worship. And like the Magi in Matthew's scripture, we read that they arrived in the home of Mary and Joseph, and they're described by Matthew as falling down kneeling, bowing before the Christ child. And so to this day, every time we kneel at an altar, every time we kneel wherever we are, we echo the wise men in their kneeling, in their falling down, in their bowing. For you see, we too, like they, are starstruck. But our worship and our acts of devotion polish his star, not because he's a celebrity, but because we know that the King of Law, our shepherd, is. I pray for you in this holy season of Epiphany that his star will never tarnish and in you his love will ever endure. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the people who are woodlawns say, Amen.